I guess. I think one or, more. Can there be more than one? Or, or, or limited. Depends one how you define it. Right? One and everything comes from that. So, so one comes from that. <laughs> so one God and everything comes from that one God. Yeah. Can there be more than one God? Just to exclude other possibilities. If it divides itself, then yeah. Hmm? They will be competing. Conflict of interest. So there cannot be, but if the rationally same, speaking. But if there's the same, then there's no. There will be conflict of interest. But if they're the same, then they have the same interest. Yeah, but they, how can they even be the same? They will be different. I'll, I'll give you a reason, uh, an example. If something is exactly the same, occupies the same space, same location, there can only be one of them. You cannot have. The moment you say that there's a ball here, and there's another ball. And if you have two balls and you describe the two balls, same color, same shape, same height, same density, and it occupies the same space, there can only be one of them. You cannot have more than one. There can only be one. If you have something with a slight difference, slight difference, then you have two different gods, but there will be conflict of will because there's a difference already. So let's cut to the chase. Why is it Allah and not Christ? Why is Allah not Christ? Okay, Christ in the Christian tradition was sent to the children of Israel through a virgin conception of Mary and who was born as a human being but understood to be an incarnation of the second person of the Trinity, the Logos. Now there, here is why Islam considers this to be not believable and not the true reality. Because the God, there is only one of kind, only one God. And he doesn't have an offspring or he doesn't have his attributes personified into other deities or deified forms. The Logos, the Logos, the Christ is the Logos. So your problem with Christianity is that God was in the flesh. That's not a problem. The clarification that we say is Christ, as understood by the Christian orthodoxy, is something that is inherently contradictory and it is incoherent and it is not something that God revealed. Because you can have something incoherent, but God didn't reveal himself to be in that way and that form. Just to elaborate a bit more, just to elaborate a bit more. The God that we say is God and worthy of being called God has to be someone who is self-sufficient. Someone who is independent. Christ, on the other hand, in Christian orthodoxy, I'm not talking about heretical Christianity, Christian orthodox belief, is not self-sufficient, is not independent. Christ is eternally, not temporarily, eternally begotten of the first person of the Trinity, the Father. So he's eternally dependent on the Father for his own existence, for his own life. Okay, so let's say I'm with you there. So I completely agree with everything that you've said. So that everything you've said was an attack on Christianity. So positively, why is Good, that's a very good question. So, once we understand that there is God, and there is one God, and there can only be one God, so our expectation from what we expect as proof and evidence for Islam should reflect that this message talks about one God in its absolute perfection and what we expect it to be as God and as his message. So we should expect God to be all knowledgeable, to be all powerful, to be eternal, to be absolute, to be independent, to be ever-living, everlasting. The Quran describes God in that perfection. So you'd say, okay, this book, the Quran, stands now as a candidate of scrutiny, that I can actually scrutinize this book, whether it's from God or not, because it's qualifying what I expect it to be, okay? Because if it says something like God someone who need to put a rainbow in the sky to remind him of a promise that he made you would say that doesn't describe god in his all-knowing nature god doesn't need reminding by a rainbow which the bible does by the way in in the genesis accounts so you know that very well so it doesn't describe god in his perfection the quran describes god and says god is such that la ta'khuzuhu Sleep and slumber doesn't touch him. 
That's how he is. He created the heavens and the earth in he meaning God described himself because in Arabic you have only two genders. There is no third it. Okay. In six days and no fatigue or weariness touched him. In contrast, you'll find like in, in Christianity and in Judaism, God created in six days the heavens and the earth. And what happened on the seventh day? He rested and he refreshed. Rested and refreshed. So my next question is, you've got Christianity describing a certain limited kind of God. Yeah. You've got the Islamic faith describing an, an unlimited kind of God. So what I described so far is just telling you as a starter in terms of whether this book is worthy of even studying and scrutinizing. So, so my, the Quran... My, sorry, my question then is, what's the inherent value? I mean, he, he can describe an unlimited God and I can describe an unlimited God. No, no, what you're describing is what you're going to affirm as to the real characteristics of God. So what I'm asking you, firstly, the Quran stands as a very viable candidate for reflection. I haven't given you any proof and evidence yet. What I've offered you is that, yes, it's worthy of reflecting on because it describes God what I expect it to God to be like. Quran offers positive proof for its divine origin and it also offers at the same time falsification test so that you can falsify that it's not from God. Okay. It's, a, it's a double way of, of establishing truth of its claim. I haven't heard that yet, but yeah. I'm, no, no, sure I'm just it. I'm just telling you it yeah. does and I can tell you what it does. The Quran says, for example, as a falsification test, if you doubt, if you're skeptic that it's not from God, then this is what you have to do to falsify it. Okay. And it only doesn't limit you to say, oh, you have to do it by yourself. You can help and seek support and assistance from anyone else besides God to do that job. And it says produce a chapter like the Quran, like the Quran, because the Quran came in the language of Arabic. It came in the genre, which was unlike the Arabic speech given to a man who was illiterate. So they knew he grew Prophet Muhammad wasallam. He grew up unlettered, not being able to read or write. And then in the age of 40, he is reciting the Quran, he's, you know, the, in, 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 in such a way, it's not like any of the forms of speech or the poetry, the sayings of the soothsayers and so on and so forth. And it challenges them. The Arabs were masters of Arabic language at that time. They, they were in their peak of eloquence. They used to have poetry competitions and the best poem would be hung on the wall of the Kaaba. Okay, in the market of Ukas, they had all these competitions. So when the Quran came and addressed them, if you're doubtful, that it's not a revelation to my servant, Prophet Muhammad, then produce something like it. You should, you should be able to imitate it because you are the masters of your language. And the Arabs fail to do so. And they're failing to do so today. And the non-Arabs who are masters and professors of Arabic language are still not able to imitate a chapter like in the Quran. So, so the Quran cannot, Quran was not falsified even to this day and it's not being falsified yet. So the contents of the Quran came at a certain time in human history, didn't it? What yes. happened before that? Yeah. What happened because before? If it's an eternal truth, then what happened before that eternal yeah. truth was communicated? The Quran tells us that God is the creator, God of every people, humankind, all. God is the creator for all, all that exists. So he has sent warners, prophets and messengers to nations of the past. And every nation, every community had a warner because God is just. He doesn't punish a nation until he sends them a warner, telling them what is required of them, do's and don'ts. Otherwise, it will be unjust of God. So that means in the past, God sent to communities, warners, prophets and messengers, and the Quran describes many of those prophets and messengers, their life, their works. It talks about Jesus Christ, it talks about Moses, Noah, Solomon, Adam, David. It took us many of these prophets, important part of their message, What brought the downfall of their people for their disbelief and what they disbelief was and the nature of it and so on what made people successful and what made people unsuccessful in this life and the hereafter the Quran describes the stories and, and history of those prophets so what happened before those prophets that were sent with the message of God 
or the same message that the Quran came with. It didn't come with a new message. The message of Tawheed, oneness of God, that you should worship none, none but God and God alone, is the consistent message throughout. The differences were in terms of rules and regulations, how to conduct your life in a civic society and so on and so forth, how to deal with a criminal or a, someone who steals and someone who's a murderer. These things, legislative rulings, differed from society to society because the need of the people were different in different times and different places. Quran has come with a universal guidance and rules and regulation for all time in one, all places. That's the difference. But the core message is the same, that God is one. He created us to worship him alone. If we don't worship him, then we will go up, end up in hellfire. If we do worship God with all our sincerity in, in, in worshiping him alone, without partners, ascribing another deity with him, then we will go to paradise, which he created for us to enjoy our life forever and forever. So this message remained the same. So positive evidence the Quran offers in various forms as it describes. So whether it's to do with evidence from psychology, evidence from natural sciences, evidence to do with historical information that the Quran provides and no one seems to have known about it and now people realize the historical truth the Quran is uncovering or even the future things will happen. The Quran is prophesizing and it happened. So you can see that these are positive evidences for the divine origin of the Quran. You mentioned two words that were quite interesting. You said punish and hellfire. Yeah. Why is a God punishing? Because God is just. According to whose moral compass? According to God. God who exists as the only being without brought into being existence. Non-contingent. Everything is contingent. God is the non-contingent, the necessary being. He describes about himself. He says, I am loving, I'm kind, compassionate, but I'm also just. It doesn't sound very just to me if I just disagree. I mean, he can have his opinion. I, I don't necessarily have to agree, do I? Why do I have to be bound to hellfire if I don't agree? So if God creates you, gives you life, sustenance for your life, and tells you, this is what you're required to do. This is your obligation on God. And if you don't fulfill it, then why do you expect God to reward you when you go against his commands? If you are employed by a company, and this is a very trivial example, and Allah, you know, God is the greatest description, it does not compare. If you're employed in a company, and instead of doing the works of the company, you don't turn up on time, and you do the works of the competitor, for example. Why do you expect a salary at the end of the month or the end of the week? Why do you expect some kind of wages coming from the company when you're doing nothing for the company? I struggle with the power imbalance. I don't see why I should be subservient. If you are given life... I didn't ask to be given life though. No problem. But you are given life. Okay. It's not your yeah, choice. It's, it's, it's not your choice. But that's my problem. It's, yeah, yeah. Yes, that's it's not your problem. choice. Sure, sure. If you're in the Titanic and it's sinking, it's no point saying, why am I here? The fact that you are sinking is the problem. So the fact that choice is given already to you, you already have been given a life and given the faculties of a choice to accept or reject. It's up to you. If you want to reject it, if you want to reject God, no, you can do it. I want to reject life. I, I, God has given me this life and I'm like, look, I don't really want it. I kill myself. Obviously, that's a sin in the world. Mm -hmm. But if, if, if I'm already given a choice to even not live, it doesn't seem like a very fair... I mean, you wouldn't be able to be have a dis having a discussion if God didn't give you life in the first place. The fact that you have life, if you think about it, having no life to life is a good thing. I mean, I don't have to go and explain to you, you know, all the benefits of life and all the enjoyments so that you're having and so on. It's because of they are not appreciating life because of some things that they need to be helped with and supported with, yeah. right? We need to not simply abandon them, we need to address their problems, their fears, their anxieties and help them out of their suffering and misery. And then they'll come out of it and they'll appreciate more. Just because they're poor people, they don't say, oh, you know what, get rid of them. Because they are a waste to the society, they are a burden to the society. Just because people are ill, we shouldn't put them in a hospital, we should just destroy them by injection. No, we should help them out of their disease, out of their sickness, out of their poverty and so on. So the reason that God gave us a life you see, I didn't ask for it. The fact that I have it now, I have to then be responsible for what I have. I have the choice given. Look, you can be a rebel. You can be a stubborn individual, say, I don't care, God, whether you created me or not. 
You can do that, but with a consequence. Because he's given you life, so you have to now at least fulfill the obligation he's asking you to. If you don't want to, fine, bear the consequence. Yeah. If I enter into a contract, I'm a lawyer. If I enter into a contract, I have to sign on the dotted line in order to accept obligations. In this case, I didn't sign on the dotted line to be born, so why should I have to accept obligations? Because the fact that you are already here, in this life, the contract has already been signed. The contract is already, because God gave you this life, so it's not something like, okay, now I have life, let me sign a contract. He's already created you. If you were not created and you're asking, I have no contract to sign, you could have said something like that. You could have said, okay, I'm not. So there are people who are not created. Look, there's only a limited number of people who are created compared to the unlimited cosmos. Those people, they haven't signed any contract. But for you, you've already brought into existence and this is already a demonstration that you are here. You know, why, why, why is it that you're saying, I didn't want to be created? Do you have some anxiety in your life? Oh no, I, I love my life. My right. life is great. However, and I do appreciate that, you know, there is some God, there is some being that created everything that I see around me. However, I do I do struggle with the power imbalance. I struggle with uh, some God handing me out something at his mercy if he wants to, but taking it away if he doesn't want to. Okay. It feels very unfair to me. It would be unfair if God created you, gave you the faculties of reasoning, intellect, did not give you any guidance, did not give you any provisions, any sustenance, and just kept you just making you suffer and suffer, you would question it. What kind of God is that? But if God give you a clean slate, he brought you into existence with a clean slate, a bank balance, like in the, with no debt, unlike Christianity with a negative balance, right? Where you're already sinful. Let, let's no, 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 I'm giving you an example, contrasting. You are created with an open slate, meaning there is nothing there. No sin, no good. You make your life. That sounds reasonable to me. And then constantly, he guides you. He even inspired within you. Quran says, he inspired within you the good and the bad. And he says, successful are those who purifies their heart, their soul, and the losers are the ones who corrupts it. So he gives you an internal mechanism already to help you at a, like a head start, that you know what is intuitively good, virtuous. Like how many people think intuitively killing is a good thing? Hardly anyone. No, psychopath is, it's not intuitively, it's something wrong with the psychological state of affairs. Most people, if not all, they know that killing, harming others is not a good thing. So our Creator has given us within our intuition some of these qualities and asks us to enable us, to make us more noble, to perfect us in our characteristics, in our, in our properties, in these positive virtues. So it is not that He's left us alone in our misguidance. He sent prophets and messengers to guide us with proofs and evidence so that we are not going to be a loser in this life or in the hereafter. Okay. The not to kill rule is very obvious and obviously everyone agrees with it. There are some less intuitive rules within the Quran and within other religions as well. Yeah, give me some examples. Um, for example, you're not allowed to be gay. You're not allowed to be gay. So if God created you to fulfill your relationship between the opposite gender, that's how he created you within your DNA, within your makeup, and then you have sexual orientation otherwise, that's your going against the divine prerogative, divine law. Imagine someone says he has or she has a sexual attraction to a tree or a dog, and they have their relationship satisfied like that. God is simply saying, I did not create you like this, Remember, the whole homosexuality, the people are saying, God made me like that. No, God didn't make you like this. You may develop some kind of orientation, something, depending on lots of circumstances. Okay? Lots of circumstances. It could be even the epigenetics where, you know, the way your mom and dad, your mom, basically how she was dealing with in pregnancy and so on. You can have many factors. But you were not programmed by God to be in that way. 
even if some kind of epigenetics and other things makes you with this kind of feeling of attraction, God is not simply saying he's going to punish you for that. He says, look, these inclinations resist and you will be rewarded for it. So let me get this straight. According to Islam, you believe that a person, is, normal people are always created in such a way that they're attracted to the other gender. And if there is someone who claims that they are created being attracted to the same gender, you are telling that person, no, you are wrong. You're telling them you, what you think your identity is, you are incorrect. So you're okay. telling them what Let me understand something is. about identity. If I now feel like a woman, am I a woman? Okay, what is a woman? A woman, well I'm a, clearly a woman because by law... But I don't, I don't know what a woman is, because if, if you can say I'm a woman, so would you like to explain to me what is a woman? Someone who identifies uh, as a woman. And what is that? So for example, I'm a woman, I'm very clearly a woman, I'm biologically a woman, I also... No, I don't understand what you say, when you say the concept woman, what is that? Uh, let me explain. Go ahead. I am physiologically a woman. I am also psychologically a woman. So, I mean, you can't argue with that. I'm 100% woman, right? So I am someone I'm trying to understand what that woman is. I, I have the physiological features of a woman that we can agree with. So physiology can describe what a woman is? No, no, I'm not, I'm not finished yet. Okay. So I've got physiology, but I've also got, you know, I, I, I look at my body and I don't feel dysphoria. I don't feel that it doesn't agree with my identity. There are some people in the world that look down at their bodies and feel I'm in the wrong body, I'm trapped in the wrong body. Yeah. Um, and that is that is something that only they can know. They know themselves best and who am I to tell them that they're wrong? I'm not transgender, but I've got friends who are transgender. Sure. Um, and I, it feels a little bit arrogant of me to tell them what their identity should be. Okay, let's understand again the identity of women. So I still don't know what a woman is. You describe your physiology, your biology describes to you a woman. Are you saying if you have those biological, physiological characteristics, that the physical characteristics, right, from the chromosome X and X, that makes you a woman? Well, it does make me a woman physiologically. Right. So in what way... Are you feeling uncomfortable on no, this? No, no. Okay. So... In, so so the biology describes women, but you are saying there's some additional criteria that makes women to women. Yeah. So what is the woman that this, this, this additional thing describes? It's, it's very elusive, I agree with you. It's very hard to describe. Um, feminine traits, um, psychologically, again, it's very hard to describe. But for example, if, you, if I woke up suddenly tomorrow in my, in my boyfriend's body, I would feel very uncomfortable because that's not my identity. Um, I, I, I can't. I can't explain. I'm not a professor in gender studies. I can't sure. explain to you what a woman is, but I can tell you that when a person is, feels trapped in the wrong body, they they disidentify, and that's sure. a very difficult state for them. Fine. And I just feel very uncomfortable telling okay. other people what their identity ought to be. If I feel I'm a dragon trapped in a human body, you would be feeling very uncomfortable no, to. Dragon is obviously different. Wait, 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 wait. If I feel, it's my feeling. Yeah. Remember, it's all about my feeling. Yeah. Do you agree or disagree? It is about your feeling. Good. For sure. So if I feel that I'm a dragon trapped in a human body, you will feel uncomfortable to tell me I'm wrong, right? Yeah, I would. But I would also question where did that come from? That's a very Why do you have to question it? Because, because it's my feeling. Why, why do you even need to question yeah. when it's about all my feeling? I feel that I'm a dragon in a human male body, biologically. Previously she said, so, who am I to a question? Brother, but it's okay, it's okay, it's okay. We, we're having a very nice discussion, okay? We, we shouldn't... Right, no, I'm really, I'm not challenging, I'm really yeah, yeah, yeah. trying to understand. That's what I'm trying to understand as well. Like, yeah. I, I'm, I'm just giving so you a scenario no back. Yeah. So, so I will be accepted in a society, and if I feel that now, I need to do my dragonly business, yeah. you should in, impede in any way unless it harms you, right? Imagine now, you should, should I get some surgery to have fire out of my mouth, some kind of um, mechanism inside? Because I'm a dragon and dragon have fiery, fiery things, right? right? So I should make surgery to have all this... It seems a bit odd to identify as a different species. It's not about odd or nothing. This is how I feel. 
Yes. So it's my feel. Remember, identity is about I'm feeling. Making, I'm making a distinction between dragons, which are A, mythical and do not exist, and B, a different species. Okay, a tiger then. Again, a different species. It's not a mythical. Tiger. I feel like a tiger. Yeah. So, because it's about my feelings, it's not about questioning it's a different species. Yeah. Because that's me. I'm just trapped in the wrong body. So, so now, tiger. You should provide everything that I need to sustain my life as a tiger and so on, and you should respect all of that. And yeah, you should have no problem, right? No, not at all. Because clearly you're doing things that a tiger cannot do. You can, you're, you can reason, you can talk. No, 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 no. Yeah. I'm trapped in a human body. That's why I'm not expressing tigerly actions. So why do you think you're a tiger? I feel like it. Okay. Do you have a problem with that? I don't have a problem with that. Right. But so I am a tiger, right? So I am a tiger in my body. So if I now want to make surgery to have a tail... To become a different species. No, 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 no. It's a different species. It's, it's not about different species. Who I am. My identity. Yeah. Why are you questioning my identity you suddenly? A no. No, a tiger is a different The question is, who am I? I am what I identify myself as. Yeah. I am a tiger trapped in a human body. So if I want to now have surgery to have a tail to start with, so it's okay. To become a different species. No. You want to become who am I? Tiger. I'm trapped in the wrong body. Don't men who are trapped in a woman's body have surgery to make them into a what they think they are? It's clearly the same species. It doesn't matter what the species is what they think. That's the problem. Why? my feeling of my identity is not respected now anymore. It's no longer, oh, you have to be within your species. What do you mean? I identify as who I am. No, I honestly, if you seriously be believe you're a tiger, yeah. I genuinely have no problem with that. Yeah. Unless and you go around So if I, around I now, if I now go to a GP, yeah. and you are a GP, you said you are a lawyer. Suppose you were my GP, my GP and said, look, I want surgery. Yeah. To have claws, to have a tail. I'm going to tell you that's not possible because I cannot transform you into a different species. That's it's not about transforming into a different species. Of course it is. Transplantation. Transplant. Give. Look, transplantation. I work in a hospital with transplants. Yeah. BMT units. Yeah. We are transplanting lots of things. Yeah. Bone marrows, transplanting lots of things. Well, all I need is a transplant of a, of a tail, a tiger's tail. And I can be on immunosuppressants to make it not Obviously repressed. Well, it's not working. Well, go and establish more scientific data to give me a tail because that's what I am. I can't put an elephant heart in my heart. Then make a heart of the elephant to transform me that works and my body doesn't reject. This body, which is not mine because I'm trapped in the wrong body, make it work. Do your scientific designs. I mean, again, this is a very hypothetical. Not hypothetical. This is exactly the gender identity that we're hearing about. Because Why are you discriminating me? No, no, because you've got a lot of people actually who are saying I'm trapped in the body of a different gender. But what I, as far as I can see, I haven't seen a, a wide group of people. What if they? What, what, what if, if you start seeing them? Yeah, if, if I start seeing them, then I'll start having questions, and then. And I'll you'll say it's okay. Eventually, you make laws saying no. If they want to become a tiger with a tail and, and, and a heart of a tiger, it's okay. I don't. I don't know. Where, I where, where would we stop? They, they haven't existed yet. Hang on, hang on, hang on. People are, people are identifying themselves as cats and dogs and wolves, many things. They're transforming themselves. Are they like transplanting? No, no, they're, they're reshaping their body as much as they can. They are. Ah, so where does it stop? So what defines who you are is what you feel, right? Yeah. So eventually, for example, I can identify myself as a five-year-old second going to school and do all the exams. Or I can actually go into sports for young, like for example, what's happening today. I can identify myself as a transgender woman and compete in women's sports That's and win agree. That, and win I agree with you. and I win. Agree with you. That's a problem. There's no problem, right? There is a problem. Why? Because you have a biological advantage. But that doesn't matter. I am a woman. When it, when it comes you are discriminating me. Who am I? Just because I'm on the wrong body. Now we're, it wasn't now my we choice. Now we agree. Actually, I do think that if a transgender woman, so she used to be a man, they grew up as a man. They now have a biological advantage. It's very difficult to say that they should be playing in the same gender in sports.
I agree that that's a problem. Ah, that's, we are here. But you're now, you are now introducing something that I do not agree with in terms of discrimination. You're discriminating me because I happen to be in a male's body. Yeah. Or you're discriminating me. I'm actually a five-year-old and you're discriminating me to go into a school um, and sit with you know, other five-year-olds. Or you can, you can see the potential, right? I can go there and then win or succeed in everything in life because I identify as the king of England, for example. Um, and he's, 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 These possibilities are so wild that where is the limit? That's why we need to question the whole gender. What does Jibreel make in the language? For example, you want to feel something you're, like, you know, you're going to There are people who think they're gods. I am the greatest of all gods. So people can identify themselves many things in terms of you know what they're not and so on. Islam brings people back to the reality. The reality is he created us and these kind of people will have. People will have a choice of attraction to the same gender, extraction to maybe the beasts and animal, extraction to like toys and trees, whatever. But God is saying, okay, you need to resist these attractions. Imagine somebody says, just imagine. I don't feel myself, I cannot control myself, but to kill, but to rape. It's all within me, it's programmed. I was born that way. I cannot but go and rape a woman. I cannot do it, it's just me. So why are you going to blame me for it? Because that's me. Where does it stop? Islam is saying, yeah, some people may have psychopathic, for example, uh, a psychopath, may have these kind of feelings and inclinations and, and desires. Says, no, stop these and resist and fight those desires. And it gives you the mechanism to how to fight it. So unfortunately, because today, like um, an intelligent woman like yourself are agreeing to the societal liberal pressures of normalizing this, what's going to happen is, in the future, we won't be able to say no, because by legislation, they will say, no, you can't amend, you can't rectify someone who thinks he's a cat and he wants to eat cat food only. You can't do that. By law, you will be punished if you wanted to even encourage that individual and says, you're not feline, you're not cat, you'll be punished for that because you're infringing on their identity. This is a mundane example. Yeah. So if we kept on allowing this liberal societal, the way it's going ahead, I'm seeing and foreseeing a future which is very, not very nice. Yeah. Islam puts us in a hudud called a boundary. Yeah. Step ahead, because no, my homosexuality no, my was Islam, a, Islam, he's a he's a heckler. That's why we avoid him. In not too far away from this place. Why are you, why are you pushing me? Excuse me. Why brother, brother, you, why are you, how dare you push me? You push me. You push brother, brother. Brother, please push me. Mister, can you can you leave me alone? Look here. Look here. Okay. Islam is a do you do you see the problem? No, no, no. Excuse me. Why are you Excuse why are me, you brother. Me? Leave him alone. One now when I come No problem. Come this, come, this come this way. Come this way. Come this way. Come this way. Come. I'm standing here one hour. It's okay. Let me ask you. You are fasting? Let me ask yes. you a question. Say, say I'm fasting. In this way. Right, come here on this way. Marshall. Problem solved. Why Islam is a discriminating woman? by not uh, going in a paradise. Islam is putting a woman in a hellfire. Why is that? Okay. Why is that? Um, right, to continue, as you were saying, um, first this one. Answer the question first. Because in the Quran, God Answer says, the question first. God says, the mu'mineen or mu'minat. Shall I give you the verse? It gives you a black and white statement of believing men and believing women, righteous men and righteous women, the, the ones who is, uh, you know, the one who can yeah, yeah. men and women, men and women, men and women, women, women. God. That's false. So, sorry, can, can That's I? That's false. That was actually false. my next question. Yeah. Because I wanted to. I'm coming from a place of curiosity because sure, sure. I don't understand. No, I want no, no. to understand your religion. But, fine, so fine. So I'm, I'm, I'm trying to explain to you. So I I'm just going to understand your approach to women. Yeah, exactly. Um, let me show you what the Quran says about this. Let me check the woman. He can show the brother, no problem. Molestation of children! 
I'll give you the Arabic and the English translation Sorry, immediately. No, 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 because the Quran is not in English, it's Quran in Arabic. Just to highlight, and you will hear the difference, otherwise. Inna al Muslimina wal Muslimat, wal Mu'minina wal Mu'minat, wal Qanitina wal Qanitat, wal Sadiqina wal Sadiqat, wal Sabirina wal Sabirat, wal Khashiina wal Khashiat, wal Mutasadiqina wal Mutasadiqat. والصائمين والصائمات والحافظين فروجهم والحافظات والذاكرين الله كثيرا والذاكرات أعد الله لهم مغفرة وأجرا عظيما Surely the man who submit and the woman who submit and the believing man and the believing woman and the obeying man and the obeying woman and the truthful man and the truthful woman and the patient man and the patient woman and the humble man and the humble woman and the almsgiving man and the almsgiving woman and the fasting man and the fasting woman and the men who guard their private parts and the women who guard and the men who remember Allah much and the women who remember Allah has prepared for them forgiveness and a mighty reward Paradise. so it is incorrect and a lie in speaker's corner to say women are not going to go to paradise God not only specify he he even said like men and women men and women this man this man all of this so God has created us with different roles and responsibilities but in his sight the reward is the same the obligation to believe in Allah and love and respect him is the same how you look on you is the same you may have more of a responsibility and in fact you may have more respect than the father at one point a man came and asked or prophet muhammad who deserves more from my mother the father in respect and so on it's a very vague statement includes everything right it's not just respect in only speaking but it will everything how you deal in track he says you know what the professor said your mother okay the man said and then who a prophet he said your mother and then who a prophet he says your mother look what man is thinking subhanallah between the father and mother he's saying your mother 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 and then who says your father so here from what we understand because the mom and dad, even though they're parents, God has given certain roles and responsibilities which are different. So how we appreciate our mother and so on, how mom, we are not even able to repay a single second of pain she endured while we were pregnant, while she was pregnant with us in her womb. The, the, the pain in childbirth that, that she suffered because of us. The pain when we were crying, we couldn't even change our diapers or our nappies. And she cleaned us, looked after us, and she would... This love of mother, if you look at the creation, how it protects so on. So God is saying, okay, this is how we have to respect. In fact, there is a hadith in a, metaphor, in a, in a, in a figurative way. Paradise lies under the feet of your mothers. Not literally, just to show you the respect that your mother deserves. Why Muhammad so, is so, having a so, problem with women? So Muhammad has described women in the way that is deserving of her respect and of her role. The difference that people see... ...will not go to the paradise. You're interrupting. And I don't yeah. want to speak to you. Thank you. Come on. I don't want to speak to you. Come I'm on. speaking to this uh, lady here, if you don't mind. So you don't want to would you hear respect, the truth? Would you respect me so if I don't want to don't speak want to you? To hear the truth. Uh, I don't want to speak you, to you. Is that you okay? You don't want to hear the truth. You don't, Brother, you don't want to hear the truth. This is a, a, an example from nowhere. Look. You don't want to hear uh, the truth. If you don't mind, I don't want to speak to you. You don't want to hear the right. truth. Uh, this is just an is example hurting about... You? Yeah. Oh, sorry. Is the truth hurting so, you? The Prophet ﷺ talked about the, the man Muhammad and woman. Himself said, you are interrupting him. I don't want to speak to him. To please, 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 don't disturb. It's okay. Don't it's okay. Don't it's okay. It's okay. Because they are men sweating. I, I will ask the question. Yeah, go ahead. What is, what is the attitude of Islam towards menstruating women? Okay. Menstruated women should not be harmed. So they should not, you men who are the husbands of menstruating women should not have sexual intimacy when she's into 
menstruation because that will be a harm, a physical harm as well. Okay? Not only just hygienic thing, it's a harm. So stay away of sexual intimacy when she's menstruating. Is that all the Quran says? The Quran says other. They ask you, yes, alunaka anil mahiyud. They ask you about mahi menstruation. Say, this is other. Takiya. Takiya. Yes, alunaka anil mahiyud. So, what is the English uh, you need? Translation. Yeah. Allah said the Quran. I'll, I'll bring it. I'll bring. I'll bring it. Yes, alunaka anil mahiyud. Takiya. Kul huwa adam fa'atazil nisa fi al mahiyud wa la taqrabuhun hatta yathurun. فإن تطهرن فأتوهن من حيث أمركم الله إن الله يحب التوابين ويحب المتطهرين. Yeah. And they ask you about menstruation. Say it is harm. Other. So keep away from the wives during menstruation and do not approach them until they're pure, meaning they're already finished and, and they're clean. And do not approach them until they're pure and when they have purified themselves then come to them from where Allah has ordained for you. Indeed, Allah loves those who are constantly repented and love those who are purified themselves. Yeah. Yeah. You women are a piece of cultivation because this is where you have your next generation. Okay? Your offspring comes from them for you. So come to your place of cultivation however you wish and put forth for yourself and fear Allah and know that you will meet Him, meet Allah and give good tidings to the believers. So it doesn't say that some people like to think like menstruation means women are totally uh, and, and impure and so on and so forth. No. It's simply saying she's because we know when people are in their menses and their periods, they're under a lot of emotional, psychological stress that's all associated with this. And people women don't pray. Yeah. Oh yes. Subhanallah, this is the point. If people, women are in their menstruation, they're exempt from fasting, or exempt from even praying. They can make this up later. Yeah. Yeah. That's why they cannot enter in the paradise. Now, um, I, I, I don't know what this gentleman is saying. Heckla, heckla. Um, I, I don't know. Is, is there, is there, is there a... You can leave the hecklers. Because the, the, the job of a heckler. Your prophet is saying this. I just wrote, I, I just showed you what the Quran says about women. Cannot enter into paradise because they are menstruating. Why is this? Let uh, me bring evidence. Sahih Bukhari, Sahih Muslim. There is an obvious Sahih Bukhari, Sahih Muslim. Issue with that passage. Oh, really What's the issue? The level is like below. So so the the so so it's so not you only. All Muslims, they are liars. They are liars. Purity is about. The, men, the, the men's it. It's talking about don't approach them until they have purified themselves. How you purify themselves is through bath. That's what he's asking you. You haven't had the ritual bath when you have finished your menstruation. So you're not impure in the sense that like you're najas, you're like filth. That's not what the Quran is describing. The Quran is saying you cannot approach her with the sexual intimacy until it's ended and they have come out of this by having a bath. Thank you. I've got one final question sure. before I go. Um, why is it that the oppression of women, and I, I can possibly anticipate a response, which is that what these people are doing is separate from what the Quran says they should be doing, right? Possibly that's your response. But my question is, why is it that there is a higher propensity of oppression of women, you know, lack of education, um, that sort of thing, you know what I mean, um, within the Islam, Islamic countries? Why is it that Islamic countries are able to accept that? Or the need to progress? Sure. Very good question. Firstly, it is not correct to say Islam oppresses women in terms of education and their progression. I, I, should, I should say, um, I, I'm making a clear distinction between what the Quran says and what people do. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm giving you a broader understanding yes. of from the source itself. The Prophet of Islam, Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa says, طلب العلم فريضة على كل مسلم ومسلمة إن سمر ورد أو أو كما كما قال عليه الصلاة والسلام 
Seeking knowledge is obligatory on every Muslim. So there are some narrations which talks about man and woman. There's words in Quran. Yeah, yeah. Read in the rape. Yeah, brother, that's right. So the Prophet said, it's an obligation. The religion that we have today, you'll be surprised. The knowledge of the religion is transmitted by a lot of women, if not most of our religion. Aisha radiallahu anha transmitted so much of the knowledge of our religion. If I were to ask you from any culture for the last 1000 years, let's go back say 200 years in the 18th century to 1000 years. Let us find out women scholars in every society, every culture and their contribution. You will struggle to find and to name women scholars, scientists, philosophers and so on throughout the world. But you'll be surprised to hear in Islam, if you were to ask me now, I can give you 30 volume work. I'm actually not surprised. I know that, I know that yeah, about yeah. Islam. So I'm, I'm just telling you 30 volume work of Muslim Sahabiyat or the women who contributed to knowledge, civilization and so on and so forth and passing this knowledge. The first university in the world, in Morocco, was by someone called Fatima, a woman, okay? From, of course, an Islamic background, she's Muslim. So, Islam never discouraged women from learning and to, to preach. As I said, many scholars today, they have women teachers where they have to get the certificate from because they are the top ones are the women. And that continued. What happened is as many societies, Islamic lands, it's a long history. Islam got, the, as a state level, spliced by imperial forces of different others. France, Britain and, and all others in, from the 1924, I think last or something, right? And they instigated puppet regimes, puppet rulers and so on. And the whole idea was, yes, we will let you have your state back. But in our terms, they will do what we ask them to do. So there were puppet regimes. So they corrupted the education system and instilled in a system which was secularized, non-Islamic. And that's why the product was there coming from generation after generation. If you go to Emirates now in certain countries in the Middle East, the majority of the people are women scholars studying in university. A woman, majority of them, educated and women. Some countries, like Afghanistan, which is the scapegoat and in the media, they're, they're not sending women to education and so on. That's their particular way of thinking and their approach they're doing. Islam never discouraged, uh, as we said. They've taken a stance. I don't want to defend them. I don't want to criticize them because this is an isolated case. But everywhere else, Islam doesn't discourage, rather it encourages you. It makes you obligatory, as I said. It is obligatory on every Muslim to acquire knowledge. The scholars would say the, the first and foremost obligation is about religious knowledge. But women and then secondly, Iran, they are is, protesting. that's another scapegoat example of Iran, yeah. right? Because Iran is another regime in which their particular understanding of Islam and so on has compromised you know, the position of women and so on and so forth. So what we are seeing rather is example which are an isolated case. These are calls that skews the data. Yeah? Whenever we look at data, these data are skewers. These are, what's the term in, um, in statistics? I've forgotten how it escapes me. Uh, you can't use this to normalize the data. We know, we know their regimes, their particular understanding of Islam has corrupted or made it into be like that. But if you study the Islamic history in terms of the approach to how women should be, should they be oppressed or should they be educated? You will see it's the opposite. My question then is separating the theory, the no, no, theology. No, 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 no. So I, I understand that from the Quran, you know, Islam there's bad. equality in the Quran. Um, that's the theology. The reality is that women are being oppressed and they are being, they have to wear certain things that even if they don't want to, they are not getting the educational experiences that they should be getting. That's the reality. So my, my question then is why is it, and you, you mentioned data skewing. Um, outliers, I've got the word now. Outliers, yes. Yeah. Um, and I, I'm, I'm not sure I agree with you there because it does, I, I'm finding it very difficult to name even one Arabic country 
one country where the majority is Islamic, where there is a semblance of equality between the genders. I think it's not an outlier, it appears to be the norm. Current society is not Islamic. Yes. I agree with you. People are not implementing Islam. So we should, to give you an example, so we have a brilliant highway code that is modified and improved to a point where we want to make our roads safe. And then we find certain outliers messing around with the highway code, driving the other way, not stopping at the red light. Now, are we going to now change the highway code for them or do we want to change them to be, stop misbehaving? We need to correct those outliers who are not following a tried and tested system of the highway code which makes our roads safe for pedestrians and the commuters themselves. Islam, in its governance, when all the systems in place, education system, social system, criminal system, economic systems, when you all, as a whole, holistically is applied, it has shown us evidence of history that it worked. It worked, it progressed and flourished. When the Queen of England didn't have a bath for a month, we had underground sewage system in the Islamic countries back then. Over Overground lighting system, right? No, 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 no. Three stones. It's Spain. Three Spain, right? So this is what, this is how Islam flourished with science, technology, advancements, right? Because of how the Islam was implemented. So we see, because of some of the things I've alluded to already, um, the, the, the regime that has been in place, who are not implementing Islam, if you are not implementing Islam, you are implementing non-Islam. That's what the problem is. This non-Islam that you're going to implement will create problems and destabilization in the society and it will create uh, harm and corruption. corruption which you wouldn't see otherwise when the whole system is implemented in entirety. So we are struggling as Muslims to remove this oppression from our lands, from our ruling elites and the systems to bring back Islam in its place. Because at one point, to give you an example, the fifth Caliph Abdul Aziz, he was trying to give charity, zakat, okay, charity to poor people. And he couldn't find people to give. So Today, the, look at how many people are poor. For Muslim. Just look at it. Today, a, so many people, people are poor. There's, there's, you poor mentioned about imbalance and disparity. It's so big. For, uh, the rich are getting richer, the poor are getting poorer. But Islam, when it was implemented, the Khalif, the ruler of the country, was don't finding lie, difficult Mansoor, to find. Don't lie, please. Don't lie. So the, the, don't lie. Yes, if he lies, I can just go on. The historical lie. figure. No, Thank you. No. Why you saying, Thank you. Why you this charity, charity they are collecting research. and they are collecting only for Muslims. I can, okay, I can do my own research. Or, Abdul Aziz, yeah? Muslim. Abdul Aziz. So you can research about his life and his uh, political activities. So he was finding it difficult to find someone to give this zakat. Because the system of zakat, the charity tax is such that every Muslim, after a certain amount of wealth, they are obliged obliged, mandatory for them to give two and a half percent of a surplus wealth to the poor and the needy. Everyone has to do that. So when this is then collected by the state level, it's a lot of money, two and a half percent of the wealth, and distributed to the poor. The poor have their rights and their shelter and so on and so forth. And not only that, of course, this is an additional bonus. Society Governments need some kind of taxation to function, right? They collect all this tax and so no, on. Friend, so this, excuse me, money, if you don't money mind. Is going so when Islam to collects the, the, the mandatory charity from the Muslims, the money is going to is in the Baitul Mal, in the treasury, is a large portion of money with its other facilities and contributions. It will implement a system in which the poor will have a house over their head, food on their table, yeah? education for the children and so on and so forth. That will be the, the basic, the minimum thing that they right. will have. But unfortunately, it doesn't... So I agree with you in many ways, what? Muslim, there are Muslim countries because Muslims live there, but they're not Islamic countries where Islam is implemented in its entirety. They are implementing usury and interest and so on. It's like... So stepping away from all the charity stuff, which I completely, uh, that's fascinating, thank you. In, in return, in terms of the 
um, gender imbalance. Mm -hmm. Can I just understand the stance here? Is it that essentially the countries that we see in the Middle East and also in Africa that you see huge gender imbalances? Is that the stance that they're not actually implementing Islam correctly? Is yes, that yes, correct? because Islam does not discriminate them because Islam did not prevent women, for example, to having her own business. That's just to lie. give you, just to give you an example. That's a lie. Islam says, according to Islamic law, if there is a husband and a wife, for example, and a wife has a business, and she's a billionaire, the husband cannot touch even one cent or one penny from her. If she wants to give her one penny or one billion pound, that's up to her, he can't even touch her. She can, if she wants to run a business and so on and so forth. But what Islam encourages that the business that you're going to do in public, it has to be in a way that is convenient for her, not somewhere where you have to mix man and woman and dress in your bikinis, whatever. It has to safeguard herself in the way she will interact in society. So Islam does a lot of preventative work because Islam considers prevention is better than cure. So the, the way we dress, the way we look at man and woman is to do with preventing all of that. So as an economic um, entrepreneur and so on, she can be if she wants to. But if she doesn't want to work, she doesn't want to study, she wants to do self-study, whatever, she wants to live in the high house and she says, provide me all of that. I need X, Y, Z, I need this, I need that. The man, the husband, has under the obligation to provide her all of that. The man has to provide her and make her happy with, if she wants like, I don't like this house, give me another house, you've got money. Well, he's under the obligation because that's how he's going to make her happy. So the man is the one with that responsibility, additional responsibility of maintaining, supporting, taking care of, of the woman. But the woman, if she doesn't want to, she doesn't have to work. So That sounds pretty unequal to me. I think there no, no, should be more no, no, no. men. No, no, she doesn't. No, Islam considers man and woman are geared differently. Islam considers the reality of their makeup. Woman can multitask, man cannot. So you cannot just praise a man saying, yeah, oh, you're better than woman. No, you're not better than woman in multitasking. Women are. So you have to give the right words due. When Islam says man are more in the physical, physique, more muscles and so on and so forth, let them do all the labor's work and so on and let's spare the woman. You can't say this is imbalance because that's how it seems to be fair because of the physical makeup in their psyche and, 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 and so on. Islam takes into account that differences. So that's that's why we say in general Islam seems to agree with equality but it goes one step further. It says no. It over what's the word? It goes over and says no. Equitable treatment. So you know about equity. The seat in the bus. You and I are there and he's an old man. He can't stand. Equality means if I got it first I can sit. I don't have to stand up. But equity means he deserves to be on that seat. So Islam gives you equitable treatment to men and women and, and, and so on in society. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah. That was very What's your insightful. name? Yeah. Tilly. Tilly, nice talking to you. My name is Mansoor. Um, I don't what, oh, shake yeah, hands. Oh, but look at this. Uh, physical touch, you would, you would agree, you would agree why, yeah. why, why we don't. That is their religion. It's their religion. Yeah. It's a religion and I respect yeah. that. Thank you. Yeah. 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 Where can we find the Quran? Yeah. You take care. Pleasure speaking to you. Where is the Quran? That is called discrimination. Where can we find the Quran? Huh? Show the Quran to all Muslims here. Mansoor, where is the Quran? Where is the Quran? Islam is not here. No. There is no Quran. There is no Quran. Anyway, Mazu knows this. Yes. That there is no Quran. There is no Quran. Anywhere. There is no Quran. Where is the Quran? Mazu. Written by God. There is no Quran. Anywhere. Yeah, yeah.